As I said, there are way too many similarities between Judaism or the Jewish version of Islam and our version of Islam. And the reason for that is because one group was there before the other one. The Jews were there before us. Well, when our scholars couldn't find something or could not understand something, instead of going with the easiness of the Quran, they went with what the Jews were already doing. And they thought, i.e. our scholars, that what the Jews were doing is actually piety. And this is the big problem. And that's why the Arabs have lived, before Rasulullah migrated to Al-Madinah, the Arabs have lived for God knows how long, how many hundreds of years with the Jewish. So, and you know the traditions, the Jewish are very conservative people. So they conserve their way of life, but the pagans of that time, the Arabs, they mingled with the Jews and they took a lot of teachings from the Jews into their own lifestyle. And now, when our scholars in the third century were designing an Islam, as I said, instead of sticking with the Quran, they invented a whole new type of evidences to support their arguments. And they called this entire new set of evidences hadith. And then they gave this hadith a status far above the Quran. And by doing so, they belittled the Quran and they excluded the Quran from the lives of people in their time and our time. And instead of following the Quran, they ended up following Judaism. We must pay attention to one thing that is extremely important. What Allah says in Al-Quran is Al-Islam. That's why it's called the words of Allah, Kalamullah, the speech of Allah. Anything else beyond that is the speech of human beings. If the hadith was a revelation from Allah, we would still call it the words of Allah. It cannot be the words of Muhammad because he's just a human being. So that's why the Quran is the only authority to speak about Al-Islam. If you look around with your keen eyes, that is, and with a question in mind away from the religion, just brainwashing and the conditions that you've been conditioned with, okay, into doing some irrational and emotional self-damaging things. Because when Allah says something easy in the Quran and the Hadith says something, we have this tendency of going towards what the Hadith says and we believe deep inside us that the Hadith must speak something better and greater than the Quran. But anyhow, that is all part of the indoctrination that Muslims have gone through for centuries and we need to break from that all of the practices that and there are in the thousands of them the when you look at them you look at them with horror because once you start to understand the quran everything else will become bitter in your life allah your creator recognized women's desires to beautification and sexiness and allah himself did not restrict women about that. He did not tell them what they can and what they can do about their beautification, except to regulate the motive behind that regulation. Haven't you noticed that sexual fornication is called zina? And the human beautification is called zina. They both share the same word, except on where you put the stress on the word. Zina is committing sexual fornication outside. Zina is the beautification. And the reason is that one and the other lead to each other. When somebody beautifies themselves, being male or female, and they go out in town, they are looking to pull and pick up the opposite sex. That's why they lead to each other. Other. Well, go back to my first under nine minutes talk where I talk about a big number of men who are courting and wooing the wives of the messenger because the texts that regard women today are specifically designed for the wives of the messenger, not for you, my sister or my daughter. Okay, these men they were wooing the wives of Rasulullah, so Allah threatened the wives and he Allah was very angry at them and issued some very serious menaces to us them. He put them, i.e. the wives, in a situation where they'd have to choose between the present life or the hereafter. Enjoy life now or pay later. And the vengeance of Allah is awaiting them on the hereafter. Because they were the wives of the messenger and the messenger is working for Allah. Attacking the honor or attacking the person of Muhammad is attacking Islam. It's attacking Allah. Okay? So Allah put them in that situation. Two, if they ever think about committing a haram sexual act, you will think like the wives of the messenger. If Allah spoke it, they, it means they thought about it. Allah will not speak something that doesn't exist. The wives of the Prophet Muhammad at one point had vile thoughts and vile intentions. So Allah 
gets in to sort out this problem. So Allah tells them, if you ever think about committing a haram sexual intercourse, then Allah will punish them twice. The twice take the most severe punishment for Fir'aun, the wives of the messenger will get twice as that uh, uh, punishment. Then, and because of their status, being the wives of the messenger, it is a, the religion of Allah is in danger and they are not in the same position or condition as the rest of women around the world. He orders them to do certain things and uh, that other women cannot do. It's the etiquette. The wife of the, uh, the president or the queen does doesn't do what you and I do. You, for example, yeah, if I'm if you're walking down the street, you take your handkerchief and you blow your nose in. That's doable. That's totally normal. You never ever see a queen do that because it's not the etiquette of a queen. You understand? So that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was talking to the wives of the messenger as people with different status. And that different status will reflect on their interaction with the community where they lived. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sets certain rules on them. He orders them to do certain things that other women aren't obliged simply because the other women aren't the wives of the messenger. Neither are you nor will anyone else because it's a it's gone, he's dead. Allah tells them, don't flirt when you talk because the wives used to flirt. Be firm to the point to stop any man who's got a desire to woo you or sleep with you. So you break that desire. You, then you must speak well and nice. And it's up to the women of the messenger of Allah to find a way on how to do that. Talk politely and nicely, but talk firmly, meaning you're not going to get anything. The wives of the messenger must remain at home. It's not you, it's, not in, it's them. And not act as they did before the coming of Islam. I.e., before the coming of Islam, women would put themselves on pedestal. Beautification, sexiness, all kinds of stuff. Go outside for no reason valid reason only to be noticed by guys and attract them. And this could be done in many ways, in thorough ways, in different ways. And to cut that act, Allah tells them, stay at home when you don't have to go out. Also, this serves to other men as a signal because the other men would wait on the wives of the messenger to come out to chat them up. So when these men do not know when the wives will come out, well, guess what? The men cannot talk to women. So Allah put them at home. Well, then our famous scholars, what they did, they saw how Jewish ladies were dressing up in their time, how the synagogue, how the rabbi would consider a pious woman to be in a particular looks. So you wear the hijab at that time, they did that. And they took that from the Torah. Well, what they did, our scholars, they did something extremely vile, those uh, famous intelligent, God-fearing sheikhs. What they did, they started analyzing the female hijab. The hijab means just a barrier. Like between us now and death, the dead people, there is a barrier. We can't go. This is called hijab. And, you know, so when they studied how the Jewish uh, dress was and what the scholars of the Jewish people said or all that kind of stuff, they came up with something extremely horrible. They came up with the eight conditions that a Salafi or the more fearing God God woman must wear or must fulfill her dress so that she is considered uh, or it is considered a proper Muslim dress. And I will stop here because it's coming up to the nine minutes again and, <laughs> and I'm gonna go to part number three. Yes, I know it's under nine minutes, but I never said one talk, one uh, one idea, one talk, okay? Uh, because I will discuss now the conditions of the hijab in the next one. Salam alaikum.